Four phases of the Lok Sabha election are over now. Only three remain. As we await the start of the critical fifth phase, it's hard to ignore the serious allegations that have tarnished the Election Commission of India, which is an institution once lauded for its impartiality in conducting free and fair elections in the world's largest democracy. Welcome back to Frontline Conversations. I'm Satvika Radhakrishna and joining me today is Senior Associate Editor R.K. Radhakrishnan to talk about the Election Commission's allegations and much more. Thank you, R.K. Now, let's start with the burning question on everyone's mind, the Election Commission's conduct in the polls so far. Politicians across the spectrum and common citizens alike have raised objections accusing the ECI of explicitly favouring the ruling party, failing to act as a non-partisan body and neglecting to reprimand those who have violated the model code of conduct. What are your thoughts on how the Commission has conducted itself so far? Do you believe that there are any truth to these allegations? And what's really wrong with the ECI right now? The Election Commission's job is an extremely tough job. You cannot please everybody. It will be like carrying a donkey, you know. You remember the story of the donkey being yeah. carried across by a farmer. Mm. So it's exactly the same story. Now, what should the Election Commission do in such a case? It should remain true to his founding, uh, to its fine founding ideals and to the Article 324 of the Constitution, which is its job of conducting free and fair elections. Mm. That is what it should do. And on the other side, if you see, elections in India have completely gone from being a fair fight to, uh, you know, no holds barred kind of fight where anything is fair. Uh, in 2019, we saw the Prime Minister invoke the Pulwama uh, warriors. In fact, uh, the people who died, the martyrs yeah. and all of that, there are pictures of them. And in fact, at that point of time, many people had asked, how can you uh, use this? Because it, it very explicitly, parties, candidates are advised that their campaigns uh, should desist from, uh, you know, uh, involving the activities of uh, defense forces. This is very clear uh, in 2019. It is being invoked even today. The Prime Minister even today says uh, something like, uh, you know, if Pakistan fires one bullet, we'll fire. 10 bullets. That is yeah. one part of the mm -hmm. problem and the EC uh, has not checked it. The second part of the issue is obviously concerning the electoral process itself involving the uh, EVMs. There is a lot of doubt about the EVMs because the uh, unit where you actually press a button mm -hmm. uh, which is the balloting unit is connected to the VVPAT machine mm -hmm. which will give you an indication as to who you voted for. Okay. That VVPAT machine is the one which is connected to the control unit. Now. When you press, you can be very clear as to what comes out in a VVPAT. You cannot be very clear as to what is being recorded in a control unit. This doubt is yet to be cleared and there are lots and lots of electronics engineers and others who keep saying that it is very easy to manipulate the system and uh, a fair reply from the election commission is expected. It has not come so far. The third part of it is in the conduct of the elections itself. Where are the numbers? They, we have uh, completed four phases and uh, suddenly from the first phase, where they actually said that it is 60% of voting, now we have 66%. How can this huge jump take place? Each and every phase there has been a problem. This is one part of the uh, whole equation. The second part of the whole deal happens to be that the election commission is refusing to take action against the ruling party, particularly the Prime Minister Narendra Modi for his speeches, whereas it is very, very clear and very fast when it takes action against the opposition parties. This has been the concern with the opposition parties. The other, uh, the last part of the deal is that when uh, the Congress President Malikarjun Karge actually wrote a letter to the Election Commission, mm -hmm. the Election Commission a, a essentially sends him a rejoinder, basically trying to refute all his allegations yeah. instead of addressing those allegations. So I think uh, a, the, the job of the Election Commission to provide a you know level playing field all for all political parties is lost in this whole uh, you know rigmarole of the Election Commission tried trying to sidestep its own responsibilities and trying to counter the criticism that it is facing. It is not necessary for the election commission to come and answer these questions. It has to address these issues and then in a viable manner, in a time-bound manner so that elections are free and fair and we all can trust the electoral process. Prime Minister Narendra Modi openly declared that if elected, the Congress would snatch away people's Mangal Sutras, reservations and whatnot and give them to Muslims phrasing it as favouring those with a particular identity. Now, that's a clear violation of the Model Code of Conduct, which prohibits using religion as a political tool during campaigns. Soon after the Prime Minister delivered those statements, the CPIM and the Congress approached the ECI against PM Modi, demanding his prosecution for creating enmity between groups, in their own words. 
but obviously nothing came of it as we know. With the ECI meant to be a non-partisan body, what does this suggest for the larger interests of democracy in India? Obviously, there's a lot of doubts over the way in which the election commission is conducting itself now. It does not start now. It starts with uh, the uh, you know resignation of Arun Goel uh, in, in early March. Uh, he came back from Bengal and then uh, you know he suddenly resigned. Now suddenly you had two vacancies in the election commission. At the top, the chief election commissioner was there, Rajiv Kumar. But then two election commissioners had one had already his tenure was over by February 15th, and the second uh, person had just resigned. Now, from then on, there has been a problem in the election commission. So, what does uh, the government do? The government decides to put its uh, people in the election commission just before a, the most critical election of our country. Now, uh, there is a committee which is uh, selected for this purpose and that committee comprises of the Prime Minister, uh, the Union Home Minister and of course the leader of opposition. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, sometime before when the Supreme Court went into this issue, it had nominated the Chief Justice of uh, India. India. As uh, one of the members, that yeah. is the Prime Minister, Chief Justice of India, India. and the uh, Leader of the Opposition in the Parliament, yeah. in Lok Sabha, yeah. as one of the members. That would have been a fair body to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, select uh, a person that would have been, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, something above board kind of uh, situation. But here what has happened is that the majority is with the ruling party, Prime Minister and the Union Home Minister. And uh, Adi Ranjan Chaudhary, the leader of uh, the uh, Lok Sabha, the opposition in the Lok Sabha, is just a uh, mere guy who comes uh, for tea. Now, what has happened as a result, some 200 names were suggested. Suddenly, this list becomes six and uh, the Prime Minister and the Union Home Minister select just two of those six and then the deal is done. Now, that is not a way to uh, go about selecting an election commission in the first place. Now, well, let us go back to the past. You had uh, a, TA, a TN session who had actually come down very heavily on political parties to the extent that if you violate a mode of model code of conduct, uh, he has gone to the extent of banning people from uh, campaigning, yeah. including somebody like Bal Thakre, yeah. had banned people from com campaigning. For six years. Yeah, for six years. You, you come back, I mean, there has been that kind of, you know, uh, action has never been taken after that. Mm -hmm. There has been, uh, there have been people like Lindo, uh, Gopal Sami, uh, Tandon, B.B. Tandon. Uh, and uh, of course Krishnamurti, these people had set the systems in place that elections can be conducted in a free and fair manner. Now unfortunately what has happened as a result of all of those is that suddenly we have uh, the BJP coming in, uh, in into power and then putting its people in, uh, in positions of power in the election commission. Now uh, you would remember that Arun Goel was actually a person who was sitting in a ministry in uh, government of India, suddenly one afternoon he has been asked to go to the election commission, report to the election commission. So suddenly he becomes the election commissioner, I think two days before the Gujarat uh, state assembly elections. So the manner of appointment of election commissioners is a problem and because of the manner of appointment itself becomes a problem, we are forced to ask the questions about the ruling party's intentions behind posting these people and that is probably why everybody thinks that action is not being taken against the ruling party or the prime minister. Yeah. Now, before the fourth phase commenced, uh, journalist bodies, presidents asked the ECI to immediately release all polling data and resume holding press conferences after each phase as it practiced earlier, you know, in 2014, 2019, etc. Why do you think the ECI is being so tight-lipped about information it has freely shared in the past? No, it's, it's baffling, so to speak, because you see, on 19 uh, for 2004, after the, uh, uh, 2024, after the first phase of polls, the ECI says uh, at 7 p.m. it says something like uh, the voter turnout is 60%. Uh, in 11 days, 11 days later, when it uh, you know actually publishes the final polls, it becomes 66.14. Mm -hmm. How did the 6% jump happen? Yeah. That is a huge problem. That's a huge problem which with the a a election commission has to necessarily answer this question. And then you look at the second phase. Uh, the press note stated that 60.96% was the voter turnout at 7 p.m. There will definitely be changes, as in uh, slight changes will be there, but then it becomes 66.71 uh, uh, according to a press note of, uh, note of April 30. Uh, see, it is, it is a problem when there is such huge jumps. When we uh, speak about the ele election process itself, there can be a 3% jump, 4% jump this way, that way, but then a 6% jump, uh, you know, one, in one phase and the second phase is a problem and that is why uh, the election commission is being asked why is it not publishing the actual numbers and just giving the percentages. Moa Maitra, for instance, after the last mm -hmm. phase has yeah. published numbers from her constituency and said why is it that you can't uh, take it uh, take this from a form 
and then uh, put it in your system. It is very easy. Yeah. They have the technology to do it. They have an app these days. And uh, every every which way, technologically, it's feasible to do. It is a mystery why the election commission is refusing to uh, publish the numbers. Anybody who asks a question about a question about this, including the Congress president Malikarjun Karge, is being uh, you know uh, is being uh, pushed back. The pushback from the election commission is so strong that uh, uh, you know it is just refusing to answer this question, but trying to attribute motives to anybody who asks this question. Now, I want to shift your attention to an article Palanimel Tyagarajan, Tamil Nadu's IT and Digital Services Minister and a senior DMK leader wrote for Frontline recently in which he attributes the ECI's inefficacy to a factor that hasn't really been discussed so far, the ECI's lack of manpower. He writes that nearly 500 full-time employees are expected to project authority, manage the system and ensure compliance and he even goes on to call them an understaffed paper tiger. What do you make of his perspective? Yeah, obviously, uh, the election commission as a body is understaffed, but then it has the resources of all state governments and the central government at its disposal when it wants to do a job. Now, the problem with that is that if the central government employees and the state government employees are committed to a political party, they will not do the fair reporting that is required to be uh, of the election commission. Now, the election commission has exemplary punishment for anybody who strays outside the system. You would remember there was uh, a couple of election commissioners who were posted to a constituency here, I think, Palani, yeah. and they went on a tour to Kodaikanal, which mm -hmm. is a hill station. Mm -hmm. And they were immediately, uh, you know, called back and they will not get any election duty from then on. Even if they are district magistrates, I mean, they're posted as district magistrates, they'll be forced to forego that election. In fact, they should be, uh, they should be removed from that, those posts. That is the kind of punishment that the election commission can give. But the problem happens to be that this is all on uh, paper, this is all... Uh, part of the uh, conduct of the elections, uh, Article 324, where free, conducting free and fair elections is the remit of the Election Commission and it can draw resources from anywhere that it wants. And the governments are supposed to give those resources to the Election Commission. Now, the problem happens when uh, a lot of these employees, number one, of course, are uh, politically inclined or uh, are refusing to take part uh, in that particular process. Yes. Now, there is a punishment for that also, unless you have a serious issue, unless you have a probably medical condition and all of that, you cannot decline election duty. Yes. And in, in those circumstances, uh, I think uh, it is allowed that election commission uh, allows some people not to, uh, you know, take part uh, in the election process. Otherwise, it's a must. Now, with all these, the problem happens to be that do these people who are being employed for election work understand the consequences of what they are doing, understand the all the rules and regulations that is put on by the election commission. There are hundreds of rules that keep coming uh, on a, uh, you know, a, as we proceed as a nation. It's a 97 crore people are voting. So, yeah. the, the rules and regulations also have to be uh, quite elaborate so that there is no amount of discretion at any level that a, you know, presiding officer or a returning officer can take to, uh, you know, help one candidate or the other. So, that I think is the essential problem. It is impossible to teach within this short span of time every single uh, government official uh, to be an effective electoral officer in uh, their constituencies or the places of uh, work. Yes, that's a problem. But how do we solve that problem is a huge question. There are people who suggest that we need an uh, election commission which is fully staffed and, you know, we need to maintain that yeah. and the taxpayers' money to, should be going into that because mm -hmm. this is the most critical part of the whole function of Indian democracy. Uh, that's a huge debate. I think it will go on forever. All right. That brings us to the end of our session. Thank you, RK. Thank you. For more such videos, please subscribe to Frontline.